I want to thank you all for choosing to come with, and worship with us tonight. As we reflect on the significance of Jesus' death on the cross, we know that there are many options of places for you to gather and worship. So we are grateful that you chose to be with us tonight. This service is truly meant to be a time of reflection and of worship for you and your friends and family who are here with you. We will have many different elements to the service tonight, from worship in song, to drama, to teaching, communion, and an interactive reflection time at the end of the evening. So to get us started, I want to make sure that you have everything you need for tonight. As you came in tonight, there were tables at the entrance to the sanctuary where you could pick up some items for service. First is your communion cup. We will be taking communion in two parts this evening with two different parts of the teaching. So I think the trickiest part of these is figuring out how to get them open. So I wanted to make sure I took some time to kind of walk us through how to do that. You will see that there's a thin plastic layer on the very top that's holding the wafer in. When it's time to take the bread, first pull back just the thin plastic layer. Then, a little later in the service, when it's time to take the cup, there's a secret way to get it open. What you want to do is press down on the tab until you feel a snap. Sometimes you need to press back up as well until the plastic breaks off. It took Pastor Rob pretty much eight months to figure this out until... <laughs> I didn't know until I read the, the script. <laughs> Um, until his daughter took pity on him when she saw him like wrestling with it on stage and so she told him the secret. But now, hopefully all of us are pros at these. If you didn't get a communion cup when you came in, please raise your hand and one of our ushers will bring you one. Second, as you were coming in, you'll see that there are these little pieces of paper on the table as well. Now these are special paper, it's not just regular paper, and ordinary paper won't really work. Um, you're also going to need a pen, which you can find on the pew in front of you if you don't have your own. If you didn't get a piece of paper when you came in, please be sure to raise your hand and our ushers will bring you one of those. So, as I mentioned, Tonight is meant to be a time of reflection and worship for you. As we get started, I want you to journey back with me in your minds 2,000 years. Jesus had been traveling around Israel for roughly three years at this point, teaching anyone and everyone who would listen about the kingdom of God. During this time, he called his 12 disciples and he performed innumerable miracles, healing the sick giving sight to the blind, making the lame walk, silencing the storm with a simple command, and multiplying a few loaves and fish into a feast for thousands, and so much more. But the time had come. Jesus had slowly begun to reveal to his disciples that not everything was as they thought it would be. They were sure he was the Messiah, but in their minds, that meant that he would come to overthrow the nations that were ruling over him and set up a time of peace where they would reign with him. But now, Jesus was talking about death, that he would die. And there is no doubt that they struggled to comprehend how this fit into their understanding of Messiah. After arriving in Jerusalem and riding into the city on the back of a donkey, surrounded by the praises of the people, it was just one week later, while praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, that everything would change. Tonight, we begin with one of his followers looking back reflecting on what he experienced and what he learned. I can still hear the deafening crowd ringing in my ears from that day, calling for Jesus to be put to death screaming, crucify, crucify him. 
What a vast shift from the huge crowd of people that just a week before had hailed him as the king of the nation, throwing their cloaks down on the ground before him and waving branches and olive branches and, and saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And blessed is the coming king, the coming kingdom of David. How quickly the winds change. Now, we should have seen it coming. Something just wasn't right. All that week, Jesus had a, a sense of heaviness about him and a focus like a man on a mission. Well, I, I was sure that he was about to reveal to us that he was our Messiah and, and to start his campaign to overthrow the grip that Rome had on us. But then the footsteps in the garden. We could hear the crowd coming quickly. I'll never forget that sound. Then everything changed. Well, when they took Jesus away, I, well, I didn't see everything. But I can tell you that what happened to Jesus that night was illegal. But they, they shuttled him back and forth all through the night, looking for any and every reason to have him put away. The religious leaders had had it out for Jesus from the beginning. And now they had finally found their answer. Well, the chief priest conducted everything so quickly in the middle of the night, made up charges. I think were so bad, neither Herod nor Pilate wanted anything to do with it. But the mob, those religious leaders incited the mob to kill Jesus. Well, Pilate knew those charges they made wouldn't stick. He knew that they were only doing this to erase a man that they thought was standing in their way. It was personal. Pilate tried multiple times to release Jesus, but the crowds just got angrier and angrier. Crucify him! Crucify him! Crucify him! Give us Barabbas! Crucify him! When Pilate saw that things were getting out of control, well, but what's a man in his position of authority to do? He wasn't about to let this Jew, this man of no significance who claimed to be the king of the Jews, cause an uprising that would be the reason for Rome to come after his neck. So he washed his hands and he sealed Jesus' fate. Now, just as Jesus had done all night long, through all of the questioning, through the injustice of it all, he just went quietly, like a man on a mission who knew what he had to do. I didn't understand it then. It, did, it made no sense. But the things I witnessed next Things the eyes just can't unsee gave the clearest picture of just how deeply God loves us. Will you stand with us as we worship together? From the darkness I called your name into darkness your mercy came you called me out lifted me up how great is your love you bore my weakness you took my shame buried my burdens in fields of grace Called me out, lifted me up. How great is your love? From 
the heights of heaven you step down to earth innocent perfection gave your life for us and we are amazed yes we stand in awe for we have been changed by the power of the cross how great how great how great is your love how great how great how great is your love how great how great how great is your love for us in your kindness you lead me home in your presence where i belong Lifted me up. How great is your love from the heights? From the heights of heaven, you stepped down to earth. Innocent perfection gave your life for us, and we are amazed. Oh, yes, we stand in awe. about how much God loves you. Think about his sacrifice. Gave his life. There has never been There will never be A God like you A love so true There has never been There will never be A God like you a love so true there has never been there will never be a god like you a love so true there has never been Let 
I've heard that there are some people in your culture who have doubts as to whether or not Jesus really died that night. Well, they must not really know what the Romans can do to a man once they've been set loose to kill him. There is no decency in those men. For them, killing a man is a sport, and they are the best there is at it. Once you've seen what they will do to a man, it changes you. It changed me. As if crucifixion wasn't bad enough, Pilate had his soldiers flog Jesus to within an inch of his life. 
Well, the torture they exacted on him made him barely recognizable. His body torn. The blood. So much blood. There would be no reason to inflict that kind of bloodthirsty revenge on an animal, let alone on a human being. But the whip doesn't care where it lands as long as the punishment is inflicted. And as if beating him wasn't enough to humiliate him, they took and and made a, a crown out of thorns and shoved it onto his head and then dressed him in a purple robe so that everyone could see what a great and powerful king he was. Really, to remind everyone what Rome can do to a man when he forgets who's in charge. By that time, Jesus had been so brutally beaten that he was unable to carry his cross to the place where they would finish the job. Sweat and blood pouring into his eyes so that he he couldn't even see where, where where he was going and just stumbling along. I watched as he fell to the ground again and again from the pain and exhaustion. Just one week earlier, he had entered the city as our Savior. Now, by all accounts, it seems like we were all wrong. When they finally got to the place of the skull, they put Jesus on the cross. I'll never forget the sounds of the nails being driven through his hands and his feet. The sound rang out so loudly, only blended by his screams of agony. And then they raised him up. And we watched as he struggled for every breath, for hour upon hour. There he was, the king of the Jews, being made an example of, dying the most horrible death this world could possibly dream up. An innocent man. A man of compassion and unbelievable love. His body broken by a merciless people. Dying a death of the worst of criminals. There isn't much in our modern day context that really can give us a picture of the torture that Jesus endured at the hands of Rome. We read this in John chapter 19 verses 1 through 3. It says, Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head and dressed him in a purple robe. And then... They went up to him again and again saying, Hail, King of the Jews, while slapping him in the face. When you think of the things that Jesus endured on the day that he would die, it's hard to gain a true picture in our modern context of what that would look like. We read in the beginning of that passage that it says that they took Jesus and they placed a purple robe over his shoulders. And they also took a crown of thorns, which they thrust down on his head. And oftentimes when we think of that crown, we'll think of something like this. A crown that is wooden, it has thorns that are sticking out. And when you look at it this way and you see the ones that we usually use, they look like maybe the thorns aren't any bigger than what you might find on a rose bush. Or you think to yourself, these are kind of dead and wooden and they don't seem like they would do too much harm. 
But I remember when I traveled to Israel a number of years ago, we were able to see the bush that was used, the actual bush that is in country and is natural to that country that they would use. You'll look at the picture that is on your screen. You'll see that what they did is they would cut off pieces of this bush. And the bush itself had thorns that were oftentimes about an inch and a half to even two inches long. And not feeble and dried out, but very strong and very sharp. And they would take these and they would wind it together and then thrust that down upon Jesus' head. What's interesting is that when you think of what the Romans were doing with Jesus at the very beginning, dressing him in a robe, giving him a crown of thorns, many scholars believe that what they were actually doing was playing a game, a game that was entitled King for a Day. Scholars will talk about this game that the Romans used to play, a way in which they would take a prisoner or someone who might be sentenced to death or sometimes even one of their own and make sport of killing them. And this is what we read about here that was taking place with Jesus. The Romans knew how to take and make a sport out of killing a man, taking complete joy and complete delight in watching him suffer. And then the passage tells us that after they had done this, that they took and they whipped Jesus or they flogged him, the Roman guards. And the closest context that we might even have in our culture today to even try to understand this is the type of corporal punishments that might take place in other parts of the world like Singapore where caning is is an example of this type of punishment. Caning became most prominent back in 1994 and I can remember when I was a young high school student hearing about this in the news. It was a a huge deal. There was a young American boy by the name of Michael Fay who was in Singapore and he was running around the city vandalizing and spray painting cars and after he had gotten caught by the authorities, they took him and they put him on trial. And he was convicted, and the punishment that was to be handed down to him was six lashes with a cane. Now, the reason that it became so notable was because the American government lost their mind, and the American public went crazy thinking that this type of torture could be done to someone as a punishment. Michael Fay later on in his life would describe that punishment as the American government was not successful in stopping the other government from carrying out this sentence. And as he describes what would take place is they brought him into a room and they stripped him down and had him bend over in an H pattern. And the caner would stand back about three to four steps and as the sentence was yelled out, he would run forward with all of his might and hit him. And four times they would do this. And Michael Fay described the pain and the agony that he went through, the deep bruises, the cuts to his skin, the intense bleeding because of this. But About a week later, he began to heal up, and it went away. Now, that sounds like a horrible punishment to endure. But consider what the Romans did in Jesus' day. When they had no care or concern for human life and their forms of punishment, what Jesus received in flogging would make caning almost seem enjoyable. What the Romans would do would they was they would take something like called a cat of nine tails. It would be an instrument of torture that was made of leather strands like this. And oftentimes they would take and they would weave into the leather strands pieces of, uh, pieces of stone, pieces of metal, anything that could cut the skin. And then they would take their victim and they would tie them or chain them to a post, often stripping them down. And then they would mete out the punishment, oftentimes around 40 lashes, everywhere from their neck all the way down to the very bottoms of their feet. And as they would strike them with the cat of nine tails, it would go and it would wrap around their skin and attach, and then they would rip it off. Oftentimes, what would take place within this punishment would be that the person being punished would be barely recognizable by the time it was done oftentimes even their inner organs being exposed. And as they meted out this punishment, it would cause a state known as hypovolemic shock due to the extreme amount of blood loss that the person would face. It would cause an increased heart rate, low blood pressure, pale and cold skin, and oftentimes even an altered mental state. 
it was referred to as a half death. And it was used in conjunction often with crucifixion. The second part of this torture that Jesus would face. And the book of Matthew tells us that they led Jesus away to be crucified. And it says, as they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and they compelled this man to carry his cross. And then they came to a place called Golgotha, the place of the skull, the place where Jesus would be crucified, most likely right outside the city along common roads where people passing by could look at those convicted and condemned to die and mock and scorn them. Because of Jesus' condition, they said that there was a man, the Bible says that there was a man who came and carried his cross, likely because he did not have the strength. But when they reached the place of the skull, what they would often do in crucifixion is lay the cross down and then place their victim on to that cross. And then they would take wrought iron stakes and they would hammer them in between, the, most likely between the wrists in order to attach them to the cross. And then they would take their feet and place them together and bend their knees up and take the spike through the top of the foot and through the heel bone into the cross to hold them in place. And after having taken and nailed their victim to a cross, they would use large ropes to hoist the cross up and drop it down into its place where the person being crucified would hang, barely able to breathe because of the lack of strength as they sagged down on their diaphragm, ultimately dying of asphyxiation. It was one of the most cruel deaths that the world could possibly ever think up. And as we understand what Jesus endured on the cross, it brings us to a much deeper understanding of what Jesus meant that night in the upper room when he instituted the Lord's Supper. And if you have your communion elements, I'd encourage you to take out the bread. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper that night in the upper room with his disciples, it says that he took the bread, that he broke it, and he passed it around to everyone that was in the room. And then he said these words, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. What Jesus said, and I believe that the disciples could not fully grasp until a later time, is that Jesus came to give all of who he was for them. He came to take their punishment for sin. And he came to take our punishment for sin as well. He took our punishment upon himself so that we could be reconciled to God through his death. And so tonight, let's remember together his body that was truly broken by this world for us. And let's remember in that the depth of his love. Let's take together. Seeing Jesus hanging there on the cross, struggling for each breath, that was honestly the moment when my eyes were opened for the very first time. <clears throat> and I finally began to understand. You see, you would think that being an innocent man and yet being treated like the worst of criminals would make a man bitterly angry. Well, consider one of the men who was being crucified with Jesus. Now, you would think that a hardened criminal like that, <clears throat> with facing the brutal treatment that he'd had, and, and, and in the last hours of his life, and with the whole world turning against him, would want to 
seeks some sort of solidarity with those who he's being crucified with. But no. What did this man do? He listened to the soldiers and the others passing by, mocking Jesus. And he joined right in with them. Are you not the Christ? Well, then save yourself and save us. But Jesus, there was something different about him. But he, he wasn't bitter. He didn't even seem angry. In his moment of greatest despair, he showed incredible grace. As they hurled insults at him and cast lots for his last worldly possessions, he looked down upon them from the cross. And then he called out to God, saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgive them. Forgive them? This was the greatest injustice that the world had ever seen, and he was pleading with God to forgive them? And that criminal, his friend who was hanging next to him, rebuked him for having mocked Jesus. And then he turned and, and looked at Jesus. And with a look in his eyes of a man who has finally come to grips with his own failures, he asked him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Incredible. There he was, hanging on a cross next to Jesus, bloodied and bruised, dying the cruelest death that a man could have at the hands of Rome. And yet he still believed that Jesus was who he said he was. The king will return to his kingdom. And that criminal believed with all his heart that Jesus had the power to save him. Not just from the physical cross that he was hanging on, but from himself, his sins, and that he could have an eternity with God. Jesus looked into his eyes and with great love and compassion, he said, Surely I tell you, today, you will be with me in paradise. We, we had always believed that Jesus came to save us. I mean, he, he was and is our Messiah. But at that moment, I realized something that we had been missing all along. What we had longed for in freedom from Rome and, and peace on this earth was far less than what God wanted to give us. Jesus came to bring us peace, but peace with God. And to conquer our greatest enemy, not, not Rome, but our own sin and death that separated us from God. And he died. A perfect man. Taking our sins upon himself so that we could receive the gift of being reconciled to God and the hope of an eternity with him. It was a gruesome death that Jesus died. But the shedding of his blood changed everything.
nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my part in this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus And how oh, precious is the flow That makes me white as snow No other fount I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Can you picture? Jesus on the cross, having endured all of that pain and all of that suffering at the hands of the Roman guards, can you imagine what it would have been like as he hung on that cross and he looked down at the people that would mock him and hurl insults upon him? And then he utters the words, Father, forgive them. Wow. That in the middle of being tortured and put to death, he would look down and say, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. The most beautiful thing about Jesus' death was not just how he allowed himself to be tortured on our behalf and to take the punishment that we deserve. But it's also the truth that the Bible teaches that not only did Jesus take our punishment, but in return, it tells us that he gave us an incredible gift. And that gift that was given by God is Jesus's righteousness. That when Jesus was nailed to the cross and his blood was shed, that he took our sin and literally in standing before God gave us his righteousness. Why is this such an incredible truth? Because often when we think of God, we believe somehow that God is looking down from us, looking down on us from heaven, from his perch, looking at us somehow with a scowl on his face. And we think to ourselves, How could God ever love me? Do you know the things that I've done in my past? How could God love me? Do you know the things that I'm wrestling with in the sins that I'm dealing with now that I can't seem to break free from? And it's this incorrect way of thinking about God that is the very thing that keeps many people who don't know him from ever coming to Jesus but it is also the very thing that keeps so many Christians distant from him as well. I want you to take a moment tonight 
And I want you to think personally about the ways in which you have failed God. How have you failed God in your past? What are the things that you carry with you today that are filled with guilt and shame? I want you to think about the ways in which you feel like you are feel failing him now and that often keep you distant in your relationship with him. And as you do, I want you to remember this truth, that Jesus went to the cross knowing that 2,000 years later, you would fail him. Over and over and over again. And he still went to the cross for you. He gave his life for you so that you could be forgiven of your past, of your present, and the future. The penalty of your sin paid by the blood that was shed willingly for you. And in the process, if you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, not only does he pay the price for your sin, but he loves you so much that he gives you his righteousness. So that when God looks at you, he doesn't see your failure. He sees his son, Jesus Christ. He sees his son's sacrifice for your sin. And he sees just how deeply he loves you. Tonight, let's take this cup together, remembering the depth of God's love for us. Let's drink. As you came in this evening, you received a few pieces of paper at the tables as you walked in. And I wanna encourage you to take those out right now. And if you would, I would like you to take just a moment to grab a pen. And I want you to think about those ways in which you have failed God in the past and you carry potentially guilt and shame into your present. I want you to think about the ways in which you are personally still to this day struggling with sin and honoring God in different areas of your life. I would like you in a few moments of reflection to just take time to write those things out on these pieces of paper. And then in a few moments as we are singing this next song together, I would like for you to come forward with your piece of paper and you can bring it to one of the jars that are here in the room, three of them here in the front. And then just drop them into the water. And pause and watch as it completely dissolves away. As a reminder of what Jesus' death on the cross has done for you. That the blood of Jesus has washed away all of your sin. Let's do this as an act of worship, bringing our struggles to the foot of the cross and remembering Jesus' love and forgiveness for our sin. So as you feel led, come forward. Let's worship together. Yes. 
himself with them should have been times if they had the knowledge that they would have been comforting him but instead he comforted them he gave them the comfort of the coming Holy Spirit and most of all he gave them the comfort of his continuing presence with them and that is a promise that we still have today that his presence is still with us that is the greatest thing that when we come to Christ that we know that we're never alone. I tell people all the time when they come to Christ, I go, your circumstances, they may not change. But the greatest thing is that you are never alone from this day forward. Amen.
There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire standing next to me. There was another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There was another in the fire. was another in the fire All my dead left for dead beneath the waters And I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore Can I get an amen? And should I fall in the space between What remains of me and this reckoning Either way, I won't bow to the things of this world. And I know, and I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding? What power set me free? There is a grave that holds nobody, and now that power lives in me. There is another in the fire. Oh, oh, oh. there is another in the fire. Oh, oh, oh. there is another in the fire. things unseen and this reckoning and I know I will never be alone I know I know I know and I know I will never be alone oh there'll be another in the fire standing next to me there'll be another in the water where you'll be I know. 
joy come every battle because I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle lift it up because I know that's where you time I'll count the joy come every battle cuz I know that's where you'll be yes Lord amen I want to thank you for joining us this evening if tonight's service touched you in any way and you would like someone to talk to or to pray with, we would love the opportunity to meet with you. If you're joining us online, just go to westgatechapel.org prayer and shoot us an email with your contact information and someone will get back to you. If you're here this evening, Pastor Rob or one of our other staff members would love the opportunity to talk and pray with you. We also hope that you plan to join us this Sunday morning for one of our Easter celebration services. Each of these family-friendly services will be an hour long, and there's one at 8 a.m., 9.30, and 11 a.m. And just in case your kiddos start to get a little bit wiggly, we have some coloring activities for them, and we will also have our chapel open as a wiggle room where they can get their energy out, and you can still watch the live stream on a large screen. We will also be having Easter egg hunts for kiddos from walking age to fifth grade, immediately following our first and second services. All you need to do to participate is head over to the atrium and look for the signs for the children of your kids' age group. We'll have bags and everything ready to go for them. You know, the beautiful part of the Good Friday service is that the story isn't over. So again, on behalf of all of us at Westgate, thank you for joining us this evening. And we look forward to worshiping with you this Sunday to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Have a good night. <laughs>